Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. I don't know if I need to keep explaining this because I'm not sure which videos come out first, but I'm wearing a sling because I broke my collarbone mountain biking. It was a bad time, but now I'm a cyborg. So that's a plus. Anyway, today's video, but before we get into it, today's sponsor. Yes, yes. Some men are lucky enough to have a great wall of hair sitting across their head, but not everybody. Two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35, and clearly if you're watching this video, you know which side of that statistic I've fallen into. Unless, like some people on the internet, you think I'm 50. I'm not. I lost my hair by the time I was 25. I'm 34 now. I wish Keeps would have been around when I was younger because advancements in science have meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. It is too late for me. My hair is not coming back. But you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved drugs for treating hair loss. So. You may have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right, if you were thinking, well, this is some sort of medicine, it must be wildly expensive, Simon. You couldn't be more wrong. Keep starts at just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, you don't need to visit a doctor. Just schedule a quick online consult, and a bit later, a discreet package will arrive at your door, and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. Be weird if you were using it in public, though, wouldn't it? I mean, I guess you could use it at the gym and stuff, but just use it at home. <laughs> Not a normal person. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not going to fix itself. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash mega projects or click the link in the description below to get 50% off your first order. That's a big discount. And now today's video. Some mega projects really deserve the term mega. <laughs> Yeah, I am aware that, I mean, this video, this channel publishes three videos a week. So I know some of the things we've covered have not been the most mega of mega projects. I'm so sorry. Thank you for watching still. And the world's largest reforestation project is one of them. The Great Green Wall, GGW, which will one day hopefully stretch across Africa, is a visionary project, spectacular in size and scope. Maybe I should have a new channel called Giga Projects. But at its core, it is a relatively simple plan. Plant a vast line of trees, 16 kilometers, that's 10 miles wide, that will stretch from Senegal on the Atlantic coast to Djibouti on the Gulf of Aden, totaling some 8,000 kilometers or 4,970 miles as a way to prevent the creeping desertification that threatens to tumble down from the Sahara Desert. When completed, the Great Green Wall will form the largest living organism on the planet, three times the size of its nearest competitor, the Great Barrier Reef. But perhaps I should say, if this project is ever completed. With the targeted completion date of 2030, the Great Green Wall has been ongoing for over 10 years, but it's still less than 10% complete. What's more, there are growing concerns that many new saplings will simply not survive without careful maintenance, and whether the project's lofty ambitions were well, just pretty flawed in the first place. As time progresses, however, it appears more and more likely that the finished article may not in fact be the Grand Wall once touted, but instead a vast mosaic of land cared for with more traditional methods that will focus on grassroots planning and water conservation. There is still plenty up in the air regarding the Great Green Wall, but it remains an ecological project of just unmatched breadth. Sandwiched between the foreboding Sahara Desert to the north and the relatively lush Sudanian savanna to the south, the Sahel is the transitional region in between. Not quite as extreme as the great sand pit above it, the Sahel comes with a tropical semi-arid climate that generally receives a painfully low amount of rainwater throughout the year, ranging from just 100 millimeters, 3.9 inches, in some areas of Sudan, to 1,200 millimeters, or 47.2 inches, in Mali on the other side of the continent. To make things worse, rainfall in the Sahel is sporadic at best, and it's not unheard of for a year's supply of water to arrive within the relatively short window of the rainy season, with absolutely nothing coming for the remaining eight months or so of the year. It's also exceedingly hot with winter temperatures, and I'm using the word winter in a very figurative sense here, anywhere between 27 and 33 degrees Celsius. That's 81 to 91 Fahrenheit, and summer temperatures between 36 and 42 Celsius, 97 to 108 Fahrenheit. That is hot. 
Roughly 135 million people call this area home today, but with predictions that that number could more than double by the year 2050, coupled with increased environmental issues exacerbated by climate change, this region, already one of the poorest on Earth, faces a difficult future. The problems faced in the Sahel region are painfully numerous, from overfarming, overgrazing, overpopulation of marginal lands, and natural soil erosion mixed with political instability and even terrorist activity. Then there are the droughts and even mega droughts that have long hit this troubled region in Africa. If you're wondering just how mega a drought can really get, try the 250 years in the Sahel between 1450 and 1700. A particularly harrowing drought came in 1914 when low rainfall led to a widespread famine across the region. Generally speaking, this area experiences some of the most consistent and severe droughts anywhere in Africa. And lastly, we come to the doom-laden word desertification. Essentially, this means fertile lands being slowly swallowed up by the encroaching desert. It sounds like a slow process, and it certainly is, but considering that the Sahara Desert has grown by 10% in just a hundred years, well, you start to get an idea of the staggering magnitude of what's going on here. In that period alone, the Sahara has expanded by roughly 554,000 square kilometers, that's 213,900 square miles, and that's almost half the size of California. And let's just be crystal clear about the effects of desertification. To begin with, the soil starts to degrade, leaving the land almost infertile, which in turn can have catastrophic consequences for grazing livestock. This gradually worsens until you're staring at sand dunes, wondering exactly what happens to your vegetable patch. Jokes aside, this is a monumental problem, and the UN said in 2014 that 20 million face hunger or famine in the Sahel region as a result of desertification. It is a colossal issue that required an equally titanic effort to address it. The first mention of something along the lines of what is underway today came from a British explorer, Richard Sir Barr Baker, who worked in the region during the 1920s and visited again in the 1950s when he proposed a green front that would stretch across the continent and keep the expanding desert at bay. The next few decades were turbulent, to say the least, across this region of Africa as countries across the continent gained independence, but also, sadly, often descended into violence in the ensuing power struggles. This idea was mooted again during the 1970s, but it wasn't until the following decades that it began to pick up steam. But still, it would be nearly 30 years before the project was formally established. In 2007, the Great Green Wall project finally came into being with the backing of the African Union, the World Bank, the European Union, and the United Nations. So, as I mentioned at the start of the video today, the goals and directives have changed over time, but essentially, it began as a project to plant a vast forest across Africa from Senegal to Djibouti, passing through nine other countries along the way, including Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Mauritania. The goal was to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, an area four times the size of the entire state of Michigan, which is hoped could sequester 250 million tons of carbon while also providing 10 million green jobs. But really, that's just the start. With the Great Green Wall in place, it's hoped that those living in and around the area will be able to farm using richer soil, which in turn will lead to better food security, economic opportunities, and better resilience against the effects of climate change. Quite simply, if all goes to plan, this extraordinary project could well help reverse the fortunes of a region facing the brunt of the climate crisis. The plan was undoubtedly noble and ambitious in its intentions, but has been rolled out with wildly varying degrees across the countries taking part. Some nations began almost immediately, while others have fallen further and further behind, and because of this, the project is now estimated to be roughly 10 years behind schedule. And before we start diving into specific countries and what they've done so far on the project, it's important to reiterate that this is a project that certainly seems to be in flux in terms of its aims and how best to achieve them. Even the name, the Great Green Wall, is becoming something of a misnomer as the project has slowly and quietly evolved from a vast wall of lush forest that will stretch across the continent to one that will encompass reforested lands, multi-purpose gardens, windbreaks, training for better water use as well as food security and land management. Even the UN has slightly altered its wording around the GGW, now calling it Africa's flagship initiative to combat land degradation, desertification and drought. The reasons behind this are fairly complex. While the notion of the largest living organism on 
on the planet no doubt sounded wonderful. It was an idea fraught with problems from the very start. Between 60 and 80% of the new saplings planted along the route have already died. After all, we're talking about planting trees in one of the world's most inhospitable places. It's not clear whether this was anticipated from the start and it's simply a numbers game or whether the scale of the project was vastly overestimated and it has suffered from poor management in certain places. But while the project will most likely not deliver the Great Green Wall as advertised, something even better might be emerging. If the nations involved really did underestimate how many trees would survive, they've shown remarkable fluidity to pivot and lead the project in a slightly different direction. And this is a project that is rapidly expanding, with an additional nine countries joining the GDW, even though they aren't technically along the proposed route. Ethiopia saw some of the earliest and most impressive action taken along the GGW, with a reported 1 million hectares of land already restored. This is focused in the northeast of the country and covers 58 administrative districts across three national regional states. Over 5 billion plants and seeds have been produced, with 51,448 hectares of reforested land, 792,711 hectares of terraces restored, 240 hectares of multipurpose gardens, and 91 kilometers of windbreaks. These are natural barriers of trees or bushes that provide shelter from the wind to protect soil from erosion. On top of this, the program in Ethiopia has created over 200,000 jobs and trained a further 60,000 plus people on food and energy security, as well as the maintenance of biodiversity. However, Ethiopia is also a prime example of just how fragile things can be. With the ongoing conflict in the Tigray region in the north of the country, this has left hundreds of thousands facing famine conditions. It's a stark reminder that humans will play a fundamental role in the success or failure of the GGW project. Niger is one country that has achieved some dramatic success that has almost flown under the radar. Here, the GTW intervention area spreads across three climate zones, the Saharan zone, the Sahel-Saharan zone, and the Sahelian zone, and has so far seen 364,615 hectares of reforested lands, along with 363,128 hectares of restored lands, both roughly three quarters the size of the Grand Canyon. The country has produced 146 million plants and seedlings and created over 21,000 jobs and trained roughly 1,200 people on food and energy security, while also stabilizing 80,040 hectares of dunes throughout a process known as dune fixation, which often uses anti-erosive wicker works to halt the shift of sand dunes. But while Niger is certainly doing well in keeping up with the GGW schedule, this success story predates the project by decades. During the 1980s, farmers in the area began turning to low-cost ways of growing trees or shrubs using rootstock in their cleared fields. The rootstock is typically an underground section of an old Old plants from which new plants can be grafted onto above ground. If that sounds a little industrial, it kind of is. Through grafting, it's possible to combine the tissues of two plants to become one. This technique is especially important because it means that you can chop down a tree root to its base to be used as firewood, but with a healthy root system still in place, it can essentially be recycled. And the effects of this have been quite extraordinary. In 2004, Niger's Zinder Valley had 50 times more trees than it did back in 1975. The last of the countries that we're going to take a closer look at is Senegal, which lies on the western edge of the planned Great Green Wall. Now, here there has been some of the most significant progress, but also some of the biggest question marks regarding the planting of new trees. The government has stated that 18 million trees have been planted along the country's 545 kilometer, that's 338 mile stretch, that's included in the GGW. The bad news is that it's believed that many of these have already died. And again, it's not clear whether it was always going to come with collateral damage or if this was down to mismanagement. Most of the trees planted were acacias, a hardy African plant known for its resilience to droughts, but also one that comes with an economic potential. The gum that can be extracted from the bark is used as an additive in anything from pharmaceuticals to fizzy drinks. Sounds great in theory, but with demand currently outstripping supply, those in charge know that the process needs to be carefully managed. Senegal has reforested an area totaling 72,452 hectares, restored an area of 119,202 hectares, and added a colossal 13,205 kilometers worth of windbreaks.
It's not difficult to find both supporters and detractors to this particular project. Some accuse it of short-sightedness and poor management, while doubting whether an ambitious reforesting program could ever work. Others argue that with so little time to spare, the project is absolutely vital, and even if it doesn't achieve all of its goals, great progress will still be made. Considering the scale of the GDW, it's no surprise that it's been hampered by numerous logistical and managerial problems. We've seen around the world just how hard it is to get everybody on the same page regarding climate change, and Africa's no difference. A progress report in 2020 stated that more funds, greater technical support, and tighter oversight will be needed if the GGW has any hope of hitting its 100 million hectare target by 2030, but also highlighted the 350,000 new jobs created, $90 million in revenue from projects associated with it, and the 18 million hectares of land that have been restored. The project has received a huge boost in the last year, with $14 billion of annual funding secured from the Paris One Planet Summit for Biodiversity diversity, which should see it through the next decade. However, as has sometimes been the case with pledging donations for the GGW, promised money is very different to hard currency delivered into a bank account to be used. The International Olympic Committee has also promised to plant 355,000 native trees in Mali and Senegal, while a new initiative, the Great Green Wall Umbrella Program, has been established to facilitate better climate finance for rural populations to grow and sustain agribusinesses, create jobs and economic opportunities, and also develop climate resistance infrastructure. We won't have a clear idea about the success of the GDW for some time to come, but with the region teetering on a knife's edge, there's really no time to waste. The project has expanded much further than what was proposed, and now includes the promotion of agroforestry, improving livestock breeding, providing green jobs, creating shelter belts for farmlands, improving irrigation efficiency for agricultural production, strengthening climate resilience, and boosting pastoral and agro-pastoral regenerative agricultural production through the Sahel region. The idea of the Great Green Wall sounded fabulous, but it almost certainly won't turn out to be like that. However, we can only hope that what is slowly being forged across 22 different nations will create an area of land that can help to turn the tide. This is a project that is becoming more about education and micro-changes on the ground involving the local population rather than a grand forest wall. This may not be a perfect plan, but it's certainly proactive, and with climate change pummeling the earth left, right, and center, a little more proactivity is certainly a welcome addition. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, by the way, please do leave it in the comments. And thank you for watching.